So today we're out here at Sydney Motorsport Park and we're here with UNSW's Redback Racing Team. Now that's a Formula Student or Formula SAE team. And basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at their car, have a look at some of the aerodynamics of the car, and I'm gonna go and actually take that car out for a spin around an autocross track that they've prepared. But before we get into that, a quick history lesson. Formula SAE or Formula Student is a student design and build competition for engineering students in universities all around the world. Basically, these student teams design a race car from scratch, and then they go and race them against each other in a variety of dynamic events, as well as some static events like cost and design presentations. The SAE competition is a great initiative, and it's certainly where I picked up a lot of my mechanical engineering skills. Way back in the day, before electric motors on cars were really a thing, I was the technical director of the UNSW Formula SAE team. And back then, aerodynamics wasn't really something that was considered that high a priority. Most of the cars at the competition still ran without any wings of any kind, and it was very much up for debate whether or not wings helped a car at this lower speed. Since that point in time, it's been established pretty well that downforce is very important even on these low speed cars, and wings have sprung up all across the grid. It's been well over a decade since I was last at the helm of a Formula SAE car, and I was very excited to find out what the differences were when you have a full aero, electric powered car. It's worth noting too that this is no backmarker team either. This car was the second placed EV for endurance and the third placed EV for auto cross over a single lap, so it is no slouch. Now I wasn't the only one scheduled to have a drive in the car today, and just before my run the car decided it would like to try a little bit of DRS by getting rid of its second wing element. A little bit of SAE style wing repair ensued, and the car was ready to go for me. However, after a few laps I felt like the car wasn't really giving me that much power, and it was derating quite a lot by the end, it was coming to a crawl. I came back in and sure enough, the battery was getting low on voltage. So we took a lunch break while the battery charged, and I ducked off to interview the aero department. If you want to check out that interview, I'll be chucking it towards the end of this video. The car was all charged up, and I was ready to go out and have a proper crack at it. For previous runs, the car had been running at the same power settings it had been running endurance, but with a bit of skillful negotiation, <laughs> I managed to convince them to turn up the power a bit more for me. Now despite being an electric car, this car is actually a really old school drivetrain layout. It's a rear wheel drive car with an inboard motor. It's got no traction control and no stability control. So it's all up to you to manage everything on the car. And that made it a whole lot of fun. While well, a few of you may already know or have seen Formula SAE cars, it's not like these things get car reviews regularly, so it's interesting to talk about some of the characteristics. Now I'm hardly the gold standard for driving skill, but I do know how to find the limits of a car and feel for the overall characteristics of the car. This car has a pretty strong initial turn in, but then it starts to wash mid corner. Talking to the suspension guys, the suspension basically has an extremely large amount of toe out on the front, which gives you that good initial turn in, but then later on it doesn't deal with the problem of pushing mid corner. In order to control the front aero, the front springs are quite stiff with respect to the rear springs. However, roll and heave aren't decoupled on this car. So as a result, they're trying to target quite a high front heave stiffness, but they can't separate that from a high front roll stiffness. So the front roll stiffness is higher than they want it to be in order to ensure correct heave characteristics and correct ride characteristics around the front wing. This contributes to the understeer of balance mid corner in addition to the fact that the excessive toe would be losing a little bit of ultimate front grip mid turn. 
a huge amount of the behavior of these cars is driven by the fact that they're constantly in a dynamic state. They're rarely in a long corner. It's typically quick slalom. So their performance is massively driven by your rate, which generally means that the front axle and turn in are a limiting factor. On the rear end, the car was extremely planted. Being an electric car, the first thing you notice is that the torque response exactly matches the demand that you give it at the throttle. On all the SAE cars with combustion engines, they were generally tuned to not have great mid-throttle characteristics, and they could be a little bit spiky. The electric completely gets rid of this. The car is much easier to handle and very easy to get the power down of corners. Most of these corners I was just hooning out of on full throttle to get a nice little slide going. But out of the hairpin, I was always trying to manage my traction carefully and the car was really easy to drive in that sense. In general, it's just a very easy car to drive. Anyone could hop in this car and set a pretty respectable lap time straight out of the box. One of the other features that's a big change from my old cars was is that this one has a rear differential. Earlier SAE cars that it used to drive back in the day, those had a locked spool rear end, so no differential, which meant that you generally had quite a lot of turn in understeer and then it would rapidly switch to massive exit oversteer and it would just snap between different modes very quickly. This car was much more behaved and progressive in its general behavior there. Now you're probably all wondering how the aero feels. To be honest with you, unlike some other aero cars I've driven at higher speeds, it wasn't that noticeable. Like the car felt like it had plenty of grip for what was quite a loose surface that we were on but it didn't give me the same sensation of grip feeling so much more abundant in higher speeds. And I think that a lot of that is just down to the fact that the speeds are so low. This car makes its own weight and downforce at 125 k's an hour, but I was nowhere near that sort of speed on this run, only topping out around 80 k's per hour. So you don't really notice, but I'd bet you that if you took the aero off, that the car would be a whole lot slower. Another cool thing here is the deflection on the sidewall of the tire. Have a look at this shot here and look at just how much that sidewall is moving around. It's really crazy to see. The other thing you'll notice too is that this car doesn't have a fitted seat for me. And as a result, I get thrown around quite a lot. It also didn't have much padding around the leg area. And so I was carrying some bruises on my knees all the way through the next week. Overall though, it is a blast to drive and I'm so glad that I got to have a go in it. Now it's time for that aero interview. So we're here with the head of aeros for two years of car here. So we have Julio here, who was the head of aero for this particular car. And then we have Kyle here, who is the head of aero for the next car that isn't out yet, but will be treated to later this year. And um, we're just gonna have a bit of a chat about the aerodynamics on these cars. So in general, could we just start by discussing what your general aero philosophy is when you're designing one of these Formula Student cars? Um, so the, the biggest design criterion for us is obviously support the mechanical mechanical grip of the car like um, FSAE is a low speed track um, particularly and so um, your priority is the mechanical grip of the car so we just there in support or aid of the car but obviously we also have a lot to give as aero um, and so our priority there is um, provide as much normal force on the tires as possible obviously as much downforce um, without increasing the weight of the car too drastically or providing too much of a drag um, penalty. Yeah, and in terms of that compromise between the mechanical and the aero grip, where do you sit on it with respect to your negotiations with the suspension department? Because I know like when we, when we talk about higher speed categories like Formula One, basically you tell the suspension guys they have to deal with whatever aero you hand to them yep. and they just have to make it work even at small aero gains. Whereas for this, it doesn't sound like it's the case. So could you sort of go into a bit more detail on that? Yeah, so a lot of the um, aero package design is very much a balance with a slight priority put towards the suspension. Um, so as is the case, and I think Kyle can speak on it a bit more this year, is there's a lot of suspension changes in terms of like chassis changes, getting a bit wider to increase the like motion ratios, give us a bit more mechanical grip and that suspension benefit, which has obviously hurt us a bit because it's, it's obviously limited like side aero intake size and things like that. Um, and so sort of that balance is where they have their say, they can do that and we've got to sort of work around it. Sort of like the opposite of F1. So that's a lot about the, the sort of design strategy and everything, but let's talk about the specific aero kit on this. Now I know that obviously right now, the car's getting charged, so the side pods are off and stuff like that. Uh, but I'd still like to talk about like your front wing design philosophy. I've already taken some footage of the side pods so you can discuss those as well. Um, so let's sort of work from the front to the back of the car and talk about why you're doing what you're doing. So. Everything kind of started off with the fact that the budget for the aero package was not that much more than $2,000. Um, so we had a stockpile of uh, the spread toe from Techstream. We also had a stockpile um, of Twill. Not a whole lot, but enough to see this package through. So 
we managed to make use of that. All the moulding, the tooling, um, the adhesives, all the fastening, that, that had to come out of that budget. And everything we did that wasn't the reinforcement itself, so resin and all that also got procured. So a lot of our design decisions and heuristics were, we're going to try and keep as many things uh, as simple as possible to conserve foam. So in the main plane, we got this out of a, a single slab of foam board, but then the successive flaps, they were all prismatic, so they were able to be laser, uh, sorry, hot wire cut, yeah. um, skinned, everything is pretty much skinned. Yeah. So to clarify then, this particular piece is a machined foam core? Machined foam core. Yep. yep, and this bit here, that's a hot wire cut foam core. Yep. yep. And then can we talk a little bit about the end caps and the strategy for mounting the wings on the end portions? So <laughs> it's actually not as rigorous uh, how we did that. So it's a, another hot wire cut foam core um, yep. end plate. Uh, it's been adhesived on. Um, there's actually no fasteners in the main plane. There are fasteners to the first flap. And as far as the mounts go, there's a aluminium or machined aluminium uh, aerofoils to match the airfoil of the main plane in the lofted region. Um, it protrudes through the laminate. It was all done within the layup itself, and they allow us to mount to the chassis. It's convenient. Our chassis extends quite far, relatively speaking, to other FCE teams, so we can get away with uh, two tabs on either side um, uh, mounted in shear. Um, so we don't have to go the full swan necks so or we can keep it simple, which is good. That end plate I do want to actually talk about because like a lot of homebrew guys, time attackers, stuff like that, they wouldn't have an end plate that looks anything like this. They normally have a more flat end plate or something like that. So the wing I think is, is pretty standard. Most people on my channel these days would know how the wing would operate, but the end plate, I really want to hear your thoughts on it. So it was kind of birthed out of the goal of just getting better flow attachment around the leading edge of the end plate. Um, we could have done a flat plate, but obviously if, if you make it an airfoil and you make it more rounded, it, it just should be better. Um, we observed no detachments in the flow, oh, in the tough testing, which was pretty good. Um, I can actually comment on that. So with the tough yeah. testing, we, we mounted quite a few tufts on the, the side of the end plate and obviously got shots um, from stationary on the side. And um, it actually had very close correlation with surface streamlines in the CFD, but it was one of the one of the key points on the package that we had very close correlation with the CFD. And in terms of this rearwards outwashing section, what what drove that particular geometry? Um, that was a lot to manage a bit of front wheel wake. Um, we did originally, so the, the reason why the end plate is the shape is it was originally um, designed as a flat plate over here, a foot plate at the bottom, and then a vertical flat plate in front of the rear wheel. We just decided to round that front edge and then sweep it out. Um, and so that was more um, any air in this region that's obviously along with the end plate, um, push that around the, the front wheel so it's not going directly into the front wheel and then under the side arrow um, later on. Um, and also just to help with a bit of the expansion as you get to the, the, later, um, the later flaps. Yeah. And do you have much in the way of adjustability in the flaps in the wing? Yep, so those flaps, um, the second element has um, three different settings. So currently it's in its top setting, but that can slacken off to other settings. And then the um, third element has another three settings for itself, as well as a drag neutral setting. So let's move a little bit further back and talk about this particular element, because I think that's something that it's, a lot of people would have questions about why it's there for. So can you explain a bit why it's there? Yeah, so um, when, the, when the new members actually came into the, uh, into the aero department, throughout last year and then they saw that they were like why do you have an element in lift orientation on a car <laughs> and um, a big point of that is with the front wing obviously being optimized towards uh, maximum downforce to get that sense of pressure forward um, it, th it kicks a lot of air up behind it and what we uh, found is that it created a low pressure region behind it which pulled a lot of the dead cockpit air out and it stagnated in front above the side arrow and in front of the rear wing and it caused the rear wing to drop about a third of its performance. It was, um, it was, it was a lot. Yeah. Right, yeah. And so just with the, the simple of addition of that simple prismatic elements downwashing the flow a bit more, keeping that, that dead air from the cockpit down so that it goes underneath, well, low underneath the rear wing instead of stagnating in front of the rear wing, um, that brought the, the whole package performance back up. Have you done much in general with managing the cockpit wakes apart from that particular device? Um, 
not much else besides with that. Um, unfortunately, we can't do anything about like little like vorte um, vortex generators or like little outwashing elements like on the top bodywork um, because of aero legality. So the legality zones ends 500 mils above the ground. Right. Okay. Um, so, the, so that's right. That's the, the legality. Yep. Right. Okay. It's yep. also an interesting point to note that because we have a space frame, we're not really like a monocoque where we're trying to minimise cockpit stresses. So. There is a lot of space for ergo ergonomics and drivability where the driver can actually see out the side of the car as well. Yeah, and the visibility on this car is very good. Going a bit further rearwards, we can talk about the side pod. Now, like I mentioned, it's not on the car, but conveniently, you can hold it in your hands. Yep. So, obviously, this is forming the shape of a wing section. But let's talk through the specifics of why you've chosen this particular geometry with the multi-element section here, with the slight lift here. Yeah. So. The big main section um, is an ACA 6412. Um, nice, big, cambered, thick airfoil um, to really leverage that ground effect. Um, and then the successive stacks over here are twofold. So they, the reason why they split is sort of ties in with the adjustments of um, and the benefits we got with the flow conditioner is that if we had the same elements go all the way across the span, they would put, um, kick a lot of high, high energy flow up into the bottom of the main plane of the rear wing. And that sort of created that parachute that held that stagnant air in front of the rear wing, which dropped its downforce. So we found by allowing the air to flow through the, the middle section underneath the rear wing more neutrally without kicking it up, um, that obviously gave us a lot of rear wing gains and then still leveraging some of that expansion um, and performance benefit of the increased stacks on the side in front of the rear wheel, which also helps manage um, rear wheel wake. And moving back to the rear wing, doesn't seem to be too much in the way of unusual design there, but maybe you can just sort of go through your selection process for why you made the cord length so long um, yep. and why the end plates are the shape they are. Yeah, so when we actually got to comp last year, the uh, one of the, the Scroot judges in Mech Scroot actually said that is the single like biggest main plane I've ever seen in FSA history. Yeah. Um, he's been judging for a while. Huh. And um, so that element over there is a, um, it's an MSHD or Motorsport High oh, Downforce, yeah, yeah. which is developed for FSAE by an F FSAE team. Um, and so, well, all three elements on that wing are MSHDs. And um, one of our members that's not here today, um, he basically took his legality box, which runs from about just behind the main roll hoop to 250 millimeters behind the, the back face of the rear wheels. Um, so it's a big legality box for us because we're running a space frame with that motor that we have out the back. So you'll have a lot of teams with the outboard um, hub motors, which have a much shorter rear to the car, and so they can't run as big a rear wing. Um, and so we had quite a large legality box, but the pain of it is that it's really narrow because it has to stay between the the inside face of the rear tires. And so your aspect ratio is really horrible <laughs> for a wing like that. Um, so he did a full CFD um, optimization um, and looked at everything from cord length of every element to slot gap, um, just to best fill that legality space that he had. And then that's what he got. Going even further rearwards, let's talk about the rear diffuser. Um, yep. Anything of note around that particular design? So a lot of changes were made on this car um, in order to sort of, that was one of the big, uh, the suspension compromises that we actually had, if we go back to, uh, earlier to suspension compromises, in that we, in on the previous car in 2022, the lower posterior control arm was a lot further rearwards. It went almost back to the jacking bar. And so that obviously limited the amount of diffuser space that you had. And so one of the, the design goals last year or the design discussions that we had with suspension was, can we move that rear posterior lower control arm forwards um, to open up more space for the diffuser? And then they were able to do it in terms of their kinematics. And so um, that allowed us to leverage um, a lot more expansion, obviously out the rear of the floor. All said and done, all the aero on the car, Yep. Give me some aero numbers. What are we making in terms of SCZ, SCX? Cool. So SCZ, we are looking at um, a, well, 4.7. Yeah, we're looking about 4.7 full car. Um, and then SCX, we're looking at about 1.7, 1.8. Yeah, and for reference, for those numbers for viewers, this is basically like an LMH, LMDH car. But look at how small it is. The thing is tiny. It's absolutely minuscule as far as cars go and it makes insane downforce levels. Thanks heaps for chatting. Very good insight on the car and best of luck with the new car and comp this year.
Thank you. Well, that's all for this video. A huge thank you to Redback Racing for letting me come out and drive their car. And if you happen to have a race car that you feel like lending me for the day, feel free to drop a comment below. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more content like this. And hopefully, I'll see you next time.